While the Red Devils may not have been hugely successful, they had a lot of industry heavyweights in their corner, including ZZ Top's Billy Gibbons, Mick Jagger, Johnny Cash, and Rick Rubin to name a few. With only one album to their name, the Red Devils' history would be full of drugs, infighting, betrayal, and death. Today, let's take a look at the legendary blues act, the Red Devils. The Red Devils' history can be traced back to a mid-80s band, a roots punk rock group named The Blasters, that included drummer Bill Bateman. But Bateman grew tired of The Blasters' inactivity and soon put together a loose collective of blues musicians in 1988. They'd go through a few name changes including the Stumble Bums and subsequently Blue Shadows, with Bateman telling the LA Times that he really wanted to make a rowdy presentation of the blues. One of the musicians who started playing with Bateman's new outfit it would be future Red Devils frontman and harmonica player Lester Butler, who had been playing music since he was six years old. Butler, who once referred to himself as Spicoli, which was Sean Penn's character in Fast Times Ridgemont High, used to play for crowds in parking lots and took inspiration from musicians like Howlin' Wolf, Muddy Waters, CCR, Aerosmith, and Jimi Hendrix. Butler would tell the LA Times in 1992, I always loved music, and ever since I was a six-year-old kid, I used to play harmonica. I heard blue one night like everybody does late in the evening on the radio and I loved it. I played a lot in high school but I quit for a while. As to why he quit, he would reveal to the Indianapolis Star in 1992, during the 80s the reason I didn't play music was I was severely addicted to heroin and cocaine. I had to learn to get off that, you know. I think people who come to near-death experiences do learn a little bit from that. Hopefully I can pass a little of that on through my music to everybody else who's either at that point or might be going to that point in their life. By 1988, Blue Shadows would get a weekly Monday night residency at a former Chinese restaurant turned bar in West Hollywood that was named King King, where they'd play a dozen or so blues covers in their set. The gig would pay about $200 per musician, and rounding out the lineup was Bateman's roommate, bassist Johnny Ray Bartell, as well as his elder brother, guitarist Dave Lee Bartell, and a variety of lead guitar players would sit in with the group. Soon enough, news would spread about how good the performances were, and even major publications like the LA Times started writing about the band's weekly residency. Their shows soon attracted sold-out crowds, which lined up around the block, and famous musicians and celebrities including Bruce Willis, the members of Motorhead, Red Hot Chili Peppers, ZZ Top, the Black Crows, as well as Lenny Kravitz and ACDC soon showed up with most of them joining the band on stage. ZZ Top's Billy Gibbons would tell Louder Sound about the Red Devils. Oh man, they were quite an outfit to be reckoned with. I was running hard at the time with one of the ZZ Top dancing girls. They called her the Alley Cat because she was always crawling about. She lived close by the King King and I became a regular there on a Monday night. And who should I make friends with in those days but Rick Rubin. He was hanging out and took interest in the band. Rubin had split from his New York based label Def Jam in 1988, with whom he had famously signed Slayer and Run DMC to and headed out west. It was in Los Angeles he established a new label named Def American, and the label would sign several high profile acts including the Black Crows, Danzig, and soon enough Blue Shadows. Rubin would end up seeing the band perform upwards of 60 times before signing them to his label. But his offer of a recording contract came with two conditions. Number one, they had to change their name as he didn't think it was commercial enough. And number two, they'd have to find a permanent lead guitarist. The Bartell brothers would come up with the name The Red Devils, which was from a previous band they played in when they were younger, and Rubin thought it was a good commercial choice, and so they changed their name. As for that lead guitarist, it was through the grapevine they heard about a blues nerd from Texas, a guitarist named Paul the Kid Size. Size would tell the LA Times, For the last five years I was a blues nerd man. I didn't play nothing but blues, didn't listen to any other kind of music, came out here and started playing with these guys, and now I'm into all other kinds of music. Bayman would add to the LA Times upon being signed, We're aggressive with the music that we play, we don't lay back and play it like the other white blues bands of our era, who play it with a smooth jazzy swing feel. The black men of yesteryear were very aggressive and on it, there was no laying back. Elmore James screamed his guts out, now Lester Butler screams his guts out, we play it tough, Rick Rubin liked that, saw some potential there. 
Rather than cutting their first studio album, Rick Rubin wanted them to cut a live recording first. Titled King King, the live recording would be culled from three live performances that was recorded by a truck parked outside the King King venue during the summer and fall of 1991. The recording would feature some blues covers as well as some original tunes. The LP would be released in the summer of 1992 and it was in the spring of the same year Rick Rubin was working with Mick Jagger on his third solo record, Wandering Spirit. Rubin would convince Jagger to go see the band perform at King King and the frontman was so impressed he even asked to join the group on stage. Soon enough, Rick Rubin would call the Red Devils out of the blue to join him and Jagger in the studio for an impromptu recording session. The session would yield 13 cover tunes during a marathon 13-hour session. The project would, however, be shelved by the Stones frontman, who thought it sounded too rough and instead wanted to pursue something more commercially viable. But the band's label thought that the Red Devils could be the next big thing. The Des Moines Register, who did a profile on the band in 1992 would write, and I quote, The group fear is falling into the jaws of overpromotion. Bartell says the label's management has visions of the band as something like the next Rolling Stones. Bartell says he tells them humbly, We don't write songs like good men. Please don't hype us like that. We really just want to play on the road and be musicians instead of the next big thing. To promote their live recording, the Red Devils would pause their residency at King King and soon hit the road supporting acts like ZZ Top and the Allman Brothers. The band's friendship with actor Bruce Willis also resulted in the Red Devils being the house band for the old Planet Hollywood restaurants that were now sprouting up across America. But the band quickly ran into trouble with Bateman telling Louder Sound, we were rowdy guys, we went out for 120 days straight and there were all kinds of illegal things going on. Drugs, fights, hookers, cops, jail, you name it. One of us was bound to end up dead. Lester had actually clinically died four times in previous years. On one occasion, he woke up in the morgue with a sheet over his head. It was his opinion that he led a charmed life. To his bandmates, Lester was a mean-spirited perfectionist drug addict, and at one point he told Rick Rubin that he wanted to replace every member of the band. But the producer wouldn't have any of it, and claimed that if they wanted to keep the recording contract, all the members had to stay. Soon enough, disputes rose over how the members were not compensated the same, and it would result in David Lee Bartell leaving the band during a gig in Dallas. They would find a temporary replacement and limp through the rest of the tour with a friend of Paul size filling in, but the bad blood was still in the air. Bartell would end up rejoining the band and they would do a 1993 tour through Europe, but the end was near. Guitarist Paul Size would soon quit having enough of Butler's behavior, but Rick Rubin still had one last project in mind for the band. They would serve as the backing band for Johnny Cash's upcoming album, with Bartell telling Ladder Sound about those sessions, saying he was a proper gentleman, but the track sounded better with just him and his guitar, and that's how Rubin put them out. Infighting, drugs, bitterness, jealousy, and a lack of ability of the band to put together a proper studio album led them to losing the recording contract with Ruben, with Bartell adding the louder sound. Lester stole a bunch of money off of us and wiped the band out. We were broke and having to sleep on our fans' couches. It was strictly his greed that took us out, that and drugs. In the subsequent years, the former members of the band soon found day jobs while still playing music. Butler would start the Outfit 13, who put out a soul record in 1997 and did some shows around Europe and achieved some fame in the continent. But he was worse for the wear, according to those close to him, as he further went down the rabbit hole with his addiction. In 1997, Butler would be interviewed by a New Zealand music mag named The Real Groove and railed against rehab, saying, I spent every penny I had to straighten myself out without going to rehab. To which the magazine asked, Rehab is a rich man's prerogative? To which he responded, Oh, it's pathetic. I love my brothers and Narcotics Anonymous, but I've lost more friends coming out of rehab because of its spring effect. Rehab crushes that spring down and then they get out and boing. It's really sad. I mean, I can laugh about it now, but Butler would credit his last overdose, which led him to seeing God, to keeping him clean at the time, as he claimed God told him to keep creating music. By 1998, Butler was crashing at Bayman's apartment with another woman, using hard drugs and alcohol, and while the exact story of what happened next is unclear, he would die due to a drug overdose. However, Butler's sister would contend that contrary to what many people reported, her brother's overdose happened because he was clean for a long time and had built up a low tolerance to drugs. In May of 2017, the Red Devils would reform with a Dutch blues singer named Big Pete, touring Europe opening for ZZ Top. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, be sure to like button and subscribe, we'll see you again in Rock Culture Stories, take care.